Up next, Gordon and I take a look at the Fujifilm X-T20 on the Camera Labs Photography Podcast. Hi, this is Doug Kay, and I'm here with Mr. Camera Labs, Gordon Lang. Hello, Gordon. How are you today? I'm very good, Doug. How are you? I'm doing very well. Uh, we're going to take a look at this Fujifilm, but uh, first of all, let's give a thanks to all of our viewers, listeners, and readers. What do you say to them? Yeah, I say a big hello to everyone who's watching or listening. I'm also pleased to say that the Camera Labs audio podcast is now hopefully available on their Google Play. So if you're an Android user, please let us know, rate us. Or of course, if you're listening via iTunes, please leave a review or a rating. It really, really helps. And as always, a huge thank you to everybody who supports Doug and my work over at Camera Labs. Whether you're buying the Camera Labs t-shirt my wonderful in-camera book, which you see here, by the way, thank you for all of those really positive reviews on Amazon that you guys have been writing. I really appreciate it. Or, of course, whenever you're shopping for anything at Amazon, be a Rama via the links at CameraLabs.com. And, of course, if you're watching this on YouTube, I've got some links that you can support us on in the comments below. So thank you very, very much again. And also, as a as response to some of the comments that we've been getting, I've lowered my microphone height a little bit lower. <laughs> Invisible. People were complaining. They were I saying know. it was covering my beautiful, they're covering the merchandise. So I've lowered it down. So hopefully that should uh, should no longer be an issue. What I might do, of course, is get a T-shirt designed with a picture of a microphone on the front. And that, that could confuse everybody. That really would. But but then you'd never notice it. But, you know, I've heard that that book, uh, which yes. I, I have yet to see myself, but I'm about to get one, that this for a while was the number one bestseller of books by Gordon Lang in the UK. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's right. In, uh, in books authored by Gordon Lang and called in camera for a brief moment in time, it was the number one uh, seller on Amazon.co.uk. It's number two at the time we recorded this podcast. So bye, bye, bye and force me up there. As we recorded this, it had also recently come out uh, in North America and the rest of the world at Amazon.com. It's also available. It's a hardback book, but it's available as a Kindle book as well. So please check it out and see what you think. And if you like it or if you don't. Uh, leave a review on Amazon.com because that really helps as well. Um, yeah, so things have been going well, well with the book. If you're interested in JPEG photography, well, it sounds terrible saying it's just JPEG photography. It's in-camera photography. It's how to get the result you want in camera without doing any post-processing. So, you know, it's uh, but it works as a travel book as well. So check it out. Let me know what you think. And, of course, when you, when you get this, you also support uh, my work and Doug's work. So, you know, I do pass on some of it. Whenever I do see Doug, I do buy him a coffee. Sometimes he buys me one, but you know, it does, the, the wealth and the happiness does spread. It's all, the in, the, it's <laughs> all in the family. That's and what we say. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And as Doug said, we're talking about the, uh, the Fujifilm X-T20, which I have in my hands. If you're watching let's, the, yeah, let's, uh, let's dive into that. Uh, I'm very interested in this camera. I have not had my hands on one yet. All, all I know about this camera I've read in your written review over at camelabs.com. So Gordon. Okay. So. It's a mid-range mirrorless camera. It's the successor to the X-T10. And the easiest way to understand this camera is that it's essentially the X-T10 with the X-T2 in it. Most importantly, the sensor of the uh, X-T2 and the X-Pro2, which is a 24 megapixel APS-C sensor. It's Fujifilm's X-Trans3. Gosh, I've got a lot of terminology out of the way already. I always remember reading the quote in uh, A Brief History of Time, Stephen Hawking's book, where he said, uh, my publisher, now I'm not going to do Stephen Hawking's voice. He said, my publisher said that for every equation you have in this book, you're going to half your uh, your number of uh, readers. And he said, well, I've got to have, you know, equals MC squared in there. So I would imagine that we've lost everyone by now. So if you're still if you're still listening or watching, thanks for staying with us. It can get technical at times, but hopefully it's it's fun and informative. So imagine you want the quality of the flagship XT2, but you don't want the bulk, the weight, or the cost. You can get it now in a smaller, lighter, and more affordable body in the form of the XT20. So this begs the important question: Doug K, how much does the Fujifilm XT20 cost? Drum roll, this cost here in the U.S., $899. Let's just call it $900. And what's interesting is that that is $700 less expensive than the X-T2. So you're going to tell us all about the feature differences, but I believe you're essentially getting the same image quality of the big puppy uh, at $700 lower price. That's right. You get the same image quality because it has the same sensor and the same image processor and the same algorithms driving that. You also get the same autofocus system, the embedded phase detect. 
you also get 4K video, but it's done a bit differently. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But yes, you're getting the X-T2 and the X-Pro 2's image quality in a much smaller, lighter, uh, more portable and more affordable form factor. But it does pitch it against some very compelling rivals that cost roughly the same. So I would say let's go through some other products. The... Um, Sony A6300 is a key rival for this. It's an APS-C mirrorless camera. Uh, how much does that cost? That's uh, $950, $50 more than this one. So um, I have an, an A6300, great camera. Uh, but yes, I think it's a head-to-head -head competitor. Okay. Um, obviously, also in the uh, mirrorless line, we have Panasonic. I think the G80 or G85 is the closest model to this. Do we have a price for that? That camera costs exactly two dollars less than the XT20, so it's in the same same price range, eight ninety seven here in the U.S. These are body prices, right? These are body only. That's correct. Okay. The other major mirrorless manufacturer is, of course, Olympus. Now, Olympus's rival to the previous XT10 was the EM10 Mark II, and those two cameras were very evenly pitched. Now, Olympus has not updated that product yet. I would be very surprised if they do not update it in 2017. That's this year, but I have no information on it if i did i wouldn't be allowed to tell you but with that said how much would an em10 mark ii cost uh em10 mark ii i have no idea because i didn't look that one up ahead of time <laughs> well i didn't it's it's a little bit cheaper as you would expect and in fact the interesting thing is is that you could actually reach to a higher end olympus model which again is quite old and subsequently discounted the em5 mark ii how much is that one well, that's $100 more. Now, that's not that old a camera. I mean, the M5 Mark II is fairly, you know, what is it, a year maybe? No, it's more than that now. Is it really? Yeah. But a great, a great camera, the M5 Mark II. Yeah, the stabilization in uh, in that works really, really well. And you get the fully articulated screen as well. It's yeah. it's a lovely little camera. If you're after a slightly larger, heftier camera, you could get yourself a nice DSLR at this price point. What do Canon and Nikon have for that sort of money? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Canon has the 80D, which is only $200 more, coming in just about $1,100. There's also the older 70D, which is the exact same price as this camera. But, you know, for $200, I think the 80D is worth the upgrade. Uh, Nikon or Nikon has a couple of cameras here. Uh, APS-C cameras, the D5500 is uh, $300 less expensive than the X-T20. The 7200 from Nikon is $100 more, but as we discussed before we started uh, recording here, these are these cameras are not all that current. At least the 7200 is a bit old. Uh, it's the one you'd expect to be the competitor, but maybe not quite, huh? Mm, uh, but the important thing here is that this sort of money is getting you a mid-range interchangeable lens camera generally with a 24 megapixel sensor the micro four thirds ones are a little bit lower resolutions but in the same ballpark in terms of resolution you're getting a step up in terms of control features build quality general handling speed that sort of thing so it's it's a step up from the entry-level models without the bulk and expense of the high-end ones so the mid-range category is really really nice i mean i know a lot of people who bought the Fujifilm X-T1 and then when the X-T10 came out a few of them actually switched over to it because it gave them the same image quality but in a smaller more discreet package which is great for street photography and I can actually see a couple of reasons which we'll discuss throughout this uh, podcast of why you may prefer the X-T20 to the X-T2 as well so it's quite interesting it's not that they've cherry-picked a few features you know and then and then but you know deliberately kept it at a lower level there are some unique benefits to the X-T20, which are not available in the X-T2. So yeah. I do want to mention that, that the, X, the X-T1 is still available also. It's $100 less expensive than this camera. In fact, I just recently recommended to someone that they, because of their particular needs, that the X-T1 would be a good camera for them. They didn't want to spend the money for the X-T2. Uh, but I have to say at this point, if I had to offer that uh, that person a recommendation today, I might come in with the X-T20 instead simply because of the better sensor and image quality. Yeah, and the better autofocus and the better video as well. I think, yeah. you know, I, I had exactly the same conversation with a friend of mine last night and I found myself slightly torn between recommending the X-T1 or the X-T20 to them and ultimately what a lot of it boiled down to was which felt best in their hands because the X-T20 
well, and the X-T2 are bigger cameras with bigger grips. There's more to hold on to. The X-T20 and the X-T10 before it are, are, are more compact. And while they do offer a kind of, uh, it's not a grip. It's it's actually, it's not, it's not a battery grip. It's like a grip booster, which screws onto the side and bulks it out. It's still a small camera and it, I like it. I, I'm quite happy with the, the body size of this, but for some people it may be a bit too small. So it's very important if you're weighing up these these bodies to pick them up and see which looks and feels best to you in your hands because I can recommend one to you based on image quality or autofocus or burst performance. Easily be able to tell you that this one is better than that one, but then when you pick it up, if you don't like it, you're not going to shoot with it and we've all failed in our jobs. Um, Doug, did you try the earlier X-T10 at all? Yes, I did. I, I like that camera very much. Well, you will find a lot that's familiar uh, to you with the X-T20 because it shares almost exactly the same body. You've really got to look very, very closely to spot the difference. Like the X-T10, the X-T20 is available in silver, which is what I have it in here, or in black. Personally speaking, I prefer the the all black one. Uh, this is currently fitted with the XF 18 to 55 millimeter zoom. This is quite an expensive kit zoom because it's it's a bit brighter than average. Most 18 to 55s are f 3.5 to 5.6. This one is f 2.8 to f 4. It's a little bit brighter, so it's also a little bit larger, heavier, and more expensive. I think when I was browsing around, it adds about three hundred dollars to the uh, body price, but it's considered a good enough lens that sometimes it's it's bundled as the the lens with even the XT2, so that's that's what I've got here. Um, if we're going to look around the body, let's first of all talk about Fujifilm's kind of philosophy uh, to exposure control. Because I know this is something that you're you're very passionate about, Doug. If we have a look at the top of the body, you'll see that there is a shutter speed dial, which works in conjunction with an aperture ring on the lens. It, it, some of the lenses, some of the Fuji lenses don't have aperture rings and you control it with other other parts of the body. But for those that do, it's a very traditional way of controlling a camera. It's like an old film SLR. So you can select the shutter speed from the dial on the top, the aperture from the ring on the lens. If you have um, the shutter speed dial set to A, then effectively the camera becomes aperture priority. If you have um, the aperture set to auto then it becomes shutter priority and if you have them both set to manual then it, it sort of switches into manual so there's no PASM uh, there's no program aperture shutter or manual mode dial on this camera and that's the, that's really sets it apart from almost everyone else in this in this kind of price bracket and I know you you feel very strongly about this Doug what do you think of this approach uh, it's what I love I mean the Fujis the Leicas these are the ones that I find the most intuitive now I don't think that it's some people would say it's because I'm old and I'm used to film cameras, uh, but I think I've I've adopted adapted to the digital age. I still find this far more intuitive than uh, than the PASM dial. So this is this is my kind of camera, no doubt about it. It's an interesting thing, though, and for those wondering about a continuity error, there we have. <laughs> Time has not passed during this video. I just whipped my beanie hat off because we recorded it just as uh, spring sprung, and it's uh, quite warm where I am today. Is it warm where you are, Doug? Uh, no, because it's early in the morning. Oh yes, it is. It is uh, only fifty-three degrees Fahrenheit outside. So, some whatever that is centigrade. Doug and I are on different continents. I'm I'm in the UK. Doug's in the. I assume you're in the US, right, Doug? I, I am at the moment. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so a lot of people go. Oh, you know, sometimes there's a there's a bit of an audio quality issue here, and why don't you do it this way? And and I have to say to people, it's a Skype phone call. It's going over the internet. I, I think it's an absolute miracle that it works at all. Uh, but thanks, thanks for staying with us. So, uh, yeah, it's it's an interesting approach to uh, exposure control. But you can kind of use the X-T20 a bit more like a, a more, dare I say, modern camera or modern approach. If you turn the shutter speed dial to T, you can actually um, adjust the shutter speed using uh, using the rear command dial Um which you may prefer to do. And that's also the way that you access longer or shorter uh, shutter speeds, as well as the, the increments in between, because the shutter speed dial is actually going up in one stops at a time, one stop at a time. So if you want to access the third EV increments, or if you want to access shutter speeds longer than one second, or faster than four thousandth of a second. Four thousandth of a second is the fastest mechanical shutter in this camera. It does have an electronic shutter that goes up to thirty-two thousandth of a second. So if you select that mode, the way that you access those faster sh uh, shutters as well as those slower ones is by putting it into T and then using the actual electronic controls in the camera. So if you want, you can control it electronically. 
another kind of throwback to to a, a golden age, an older age. I don't know, Doug. Can you see the shutter release? Can you see there's I something unusual this. about that? You can put a cable into it. Looks yeah, like it's to a me. threaded. It's a threaded yeah. cable release. Now that's not new on this video. I've been doing this on a few of their cameras, but it's quite nice. Now it's nice for me because I'm old enough to have a, a threaded cable release. But do they still sell them? Oh, absolutely. Really? Absolutely. I I just bought a, a new one for one of my speed graphics. Really? How much yeah. did that cost you? Not the speed graphics, uh, the cable release. The, the cable was, was three ninety nine. So it gives you access to nice, cheap and affordable uh, and very tactile. You know, you push this thing down, it's got a spring and they've got a little kind of lock on them for when you're doing bold, long exposures, which you do need to do with a camera like this because unfortunately Fujifilm still hasn't equipped the X-T20 or, or any of its cameras with a bulb timer. So unlike many of its rivals, you can't say, I'm going to program you to take a one minute or two minute or four minute exposure. If you want to do anything longer than 30 seconds, you have to have a cable release. So you can either do it with uh, with a mechanical cable release at the top, or you can use a USB release on the side. And this probably is as good a time as any to open up that side door and show you the ports, which are exactly the same as the X-T10 before it. We've got a, a little HDMI and a little USB and an a little microphone uh, port as well. Now that microphone port is 2.5 millimeters. That is not a standard size really, is it? 3.5 is your standard microphone jack. So you are gonna need an inconvenient adapter for that, unless you've got 2.5 mil jack on I'm your I'm looking microphone. at that, I'm saying, give me, couldn't they squeeze one more millimeter out of that? Couldn't they put a three and a half in there? Well, they could. Now, now this is also so that it retains compatibility with some other cable releases, because there's three different kind of cable releases you can use with this camera. You can use a 2.5 millimeter, you can use a USB, or you can use a physical one on the front. So they've got a few bases covered here. The one thing that has changed here is the USB port is now, hooray, USB chargeable. You can charge the battery inside the camera over USB, which you couldn't do before. But Fujifilm do also supply this with an external AC charging unit, which to me is the best of both worlds. So, you know, you can charge it externally uh, as you would con conventionally, or you can uh, connect it to a USB uh, port and charge it that way. So I'm very, very pleased with that. You're probably kind of thinking, wait a minute, I, I suspect this is pretty much the same shell as the X-T10. And, and that also applies when we look underneath the camera to the battery compartment, because that is where the SD memory card is still housed. And you know what? I hate it when the memory card is housed with the battery underneath the camera. Sony do that on some of theirs as well. If I push it to try and eject it, there's very little to get your fingers around. I'm, I really struggle trying to get the memory card out of these slots here. And when I do, I invariably eject the battery and it flies across the floor. So I'm not very happy about that. It also means that you'll see how close it is to the tripod thread. It also means that when you are mounted on a tripod, you're, you're not going to be getting that memory card out of the body. And if you are shooting a lot and you run out of memory, then you're going to need to remove your plate, remove it from the tripod to do that. Now I know maybe there's not room to put it in the side on a camera this size. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. But that's not my problem, is it? That's, that's the engineer's problem. <laughs> Doug, what do you think of the memory cards in the base? Oh, you know, it doesn't bother me. You know, oh, in my my smaller, so I have the same thing. Well, but in the smaller cameras, you know, that's the price you pay to get it smaller. Um, you know, look look at Sony. Sony has the exact same thing on their APS-C cameras. When you go to the full frame cameras, then you have a separate door for the SD card. Um, so... You know, it's like it's like people who complain about the small batteries and the poor battery life of all smaller cameras. Yeah, that's that's what you get when you want a smaller, lighter camera. You get a smaller, lighter battery. You get fewer exposures, so you carry a spare battery. I don't have a problem with that. You know, because I I need at least three batteries because there's a good chance when I go out in the field that one of them is going to be dead anyway because I thought it was charged and it wasn't. So, eh, doesn't bother me. Okay, all right, I'll move on. I will, however, say that as we suspect that it's the same kind of shell as before, that means it's the same SD memory card slot as before. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because it has not been updated to support the extra speed of UHS Class 2 cards, at least not in my tests. I did my usual uh, buffer flushing test. That sounds a bit rude, doesn't it? I flushed my <laughs> buffer and timed how long it took until it was completely clear. 
and there was no not a scrap of difference between using a UHS class one card or a UHS class two card in terms of writing that buffer once it was filled you know if you shoot a bunch of raw files and it says right oh i've got enough raw files that's it i'm going to write them now to the card and it, it there was no benefit to that now i i always say at this point it's important to remember you can put a uhs class 2 card now they are compatible they're backwards compatible you can use them in any camera it's just that only some of them will support the extra speed of uh, uhs class 2 so you, at this point you'd be thinking well physically it seems to be the same as the xt10 but let me show you a couple of other things actually I, i'm going to show you now here's here's one of the differences between the xt20 and the xt2 and similarly to the xt10 and the xt1 before it around the shutter speed dial you'll see a switch that will actually take you straight into a fully automatic mode. It's almost like a kind of Hitchhiker's Guide to Galaxy don't panic button, except it's a switch and it doesn't say don't panic on it. But the idea is, is that you flick it to fully auto and then you hand it over to someone to take a picture of you when you're on the holidays. Or, you know, if you want to, let's say you've been really mucking about with the settings to get some elaborate effect. Perhaps you were trying to do that because you wanted to achieve the effect in camera. And uh, then suddenly you see uh, an opportunity over there, somebody, someone famous or, or someone in your family doing a, a really cool pose or something. Well, instead of thinking, oh, crikey, I've got to dial everything back to normal, you know, to get a proper shot, just flick it into auto, take your picture and then flick it back again and continue creative work. So I really like that, that it has that. And that gives it, you know, a speed and flexibility that's lacking on, on the top model. I think it's, I think it's terrific. And I got to tell you, as a street photographer, now when I go out, I ha I walk around, I carry my camera in full auto mode. Uh, and that means if I want to dial in a particular aperture, I dial in the aperture, I put it back. If I want a particular shutter speed, I dial it in, I put it back. But this would be one step easier because I, right now, I may have to go and change a few settings to get it back to full auto. I love the fact that full auto means I'm equally prepared, equally unprepared for every possible shot. But it's a it's a good way to walk around. It's very good. Definitely. I always remember a, a long time ago, I recorded a series of uh, videos called DSLR tips for complete beginners. And they were they were watched by people who weren't complete beginners. And they, they a lot of them got very annoyed with this kind of end statement, I said, which is before you, you know, once you've finished this tutorial, always put it back to auto or at least semi-automatic mode so that you're ready to go. And they went, oh, who uses auto? I think that's terrible. You know, there's nothing wrong with auto. What, you know, the, what are you trying to prove that you're, you know, you're amazing at setting the manual speed or something? It's, it's almost like being able to reassemble a, a rifle in pitch darkness. I mean, if you are in the army and you need to be able to do that, fine. But for everyone else, you don't need to be able to do that. So, you know, we're trying to, we're photographers and we're trying to, we're trying to take great photos. And if that means that, you know, at some point you use some automatic or semi-automatic, there's no shame in that. Use that. So I, I, I like that. Yeah, the one thing I want to say, take a, another sidebar here, which is full auto means that you're leaving it to the camera to make certain decisions. And we don't talk about this much, but different camera manufacturers have a totally different algorithm that they apply. And it varies greatly. So, for example, my Sony cameras, which are the 6300, the A7R Mark II, uh, I'm not particularly impressed with the decisions they make. Uh, whereas... Uh, my Leica Q, for example, is spectacular. It will almost always favor shooting wide open. Um, it will boost the ISO as appropriate, I would say. I love the decisions it makes. So anyone who's interested in shooting full auto needs to go out and take a look at their cameras and see, well, what decision is it making? Is it favoring wide open aperture? Is it favoring higher shutter speed, lower shutter speed? Because they vary greatly. Yeah, definitely. And it is, as you say, it's a case of getting to know your camera and how it reacts to certain situations and how you then react to it. For example, knowing that with this camera, you go, you've got to lock the focus or lock the exposure at a certain point because it's going to react sort of differently. Speaking of overriding that, there is a manual exposure compensation dial on the corner here. That was on the X-T10. One of the new things on the X-T20 is it now has the C position that you see on some of Fujifilm's other latest cameras. This extends that range to plus or minus 5 EV. Next to that, you'll notice a function button that previously was the record, the movie record button on the X-T10. That movie record button is now gone. And in its place, they've just put a normal function button. Interestingly, this does not mean that this camera has two dedicated function buttons because the one that was on the X-T10 in the corner is gone. Why would they remove it? 
from the corner at the back. I, why, why take that off? That would have been nice. Maybe they were trying to differentiate it further from the extra customization of the uh, of the XT2. You can, however, customize the uh, cross keys as before, so you can still change a lot. So what about recording movies? Well, movies are now added to the drive mode menu at the end. So the drive mode menu looks the same as on the XT10, except there's now a movie record uh, section on the side of that. And you'll also notice a little lever a lever. I don't know why I pronounced it lever, but there's a little lever around the uh, the <laughs> the edge of this dial. And if you turn it as before, the flash pops up. And there is another advantage that the XT20 and the XT10 have over the XT1 and the XT2 because those higher end models do not have built-in flashes because they're posh. And posh cameras don't have built-in flashes because they're owned by posh photographers who have separate flashes or use available light. But it's nice to have a pop-up flash. I like it. So that's one of the benefits that you get over the, the higher-end one. Doug, do you think you would use the pop-up flash? You know, I, I am using it more and more. I have very few cameras that have it, but I'm shooting more and more fill flash on the streets. Uh, you know, where I'll bring the exposure, the flash exposure compensation down a stop and a half or so and use it just for fill. Very nice effect. So um, uh, I tend to have cameras that don't have a flash built in, but when I do, I have used it. Hey, the one question before we move on to more details. You know, what we like about these controls is dedicated controls for shutter speed, aperture, um, and so forth. What about ISO? What do you have to do to change the ISO on this camera? A good question. Now, on the X-T2 and the X-T1, there was a dedicated ISO dial, so you would just turn a dial for that. On this, you have to go through the menu system, but you can customize the camera so that one of those function buttons will adjust the ISO, and that's one of the first things that I do when I when I have the X-T10 and the X-T20. I've customized this function button on the front to adjust the ISO, but equally, you could do it with one of these at the back. Uh, by default, the cross key pointing right button is set up to adjust the flash options. Well, I, I don't really use the flash, so I've reconfigured that to manually position the AF area using the buttons as well. Although there is another way of doing that that I'll tell you in just a moment. Before I do that, there is a front and a rear dial on this camera, which you can use to make adjust, exposure adjustments or to adjust various things in the menus. And they're, they're both pushed to click and they've, they've got a very nice action to them. I, I really like turning these dials and pushing them. They're, they've got a, a nice feel about them. But here's a weird thing. Now, on the X-T10, let me make sure I've got this the right way around. On the X-T10, you could customize the function of the front dial but not the one on the rear. The one on the rear only did one thing, and that was to magnify the active focusing area, either when you're shooting or in playback. And that's a really nice feature bit to do that, by the way, in playback, because you're playing an image and you just push this dial and then immediately it magnifies the, whatever was the, wherever the focusing point was. So that's, that's really nice. Now, the rear dial still does that, but now on the uh, on the XT20, the rear dial, you can customize that now. So you think, great, I can now customize them both. Except you can't because now you can't customize the front dial. Hmm. So they've switched it around. So on the old now, unless I've got this wrong, because it's a bit confusing. So on the XT10, you could customize the front dial, but not the back dial. And now on the XT20, you can customize the back dial but not the front dial. And in fact, the front dial doesn't appear to do very much at all. The only, the only thing I can get it to do is when you have the exposure compensation dial set to C, you then adjust the exposure compensation using the front, the front dial. And if you have a lens that doesn't have an aperture ring, like one of the, I think it's the XC series, the budget lenses, then that would control the aperture. But apart from that, it doesn't really do much. And considering it's got a push to click option as well, that could really, you know, select two different functions or, you know, work in a different way. I really hope that Fujifilm addresses this with a firmware update because it's got a control here that could really be customized and be very, very useful. And at the moment, as far as I can see, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I can't really see much use for that front dial, and I have no idea why they would switch that functionality from front to rear. You know, on the old, it's like, oh, no, you can you can only customize one dial at a time on this camera. <laughs> you can't have them both. You you know, you 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 complained before, so we switched it. It's like, no, we want them both. We want them both. Mm. So someone please tell me that I've done it wrong, and you can customize them both. And you know, one of the things that I think I think both of us love about the Fuji line is there is no company that comes close to Fuji when it comes to providing improvements in firmware updates. 
Um, you know, a lot of companies will eventually get around to fixing a problem with an update, but Fuji cameras get better with age. Uh, maybe the only camera that does it quite so well. Absolutely. So let's look at, um, so that's, that's kind of the controls covered. Let's have a look at the, uh, the composition. Now, this camera, of course, has an electronic viewfinder and a screen. And being 100% live view, it's a mirrorless camera. You can use either of them for composition. And they're pretty much the same as before. The viewfinder, like most viewfinders in this class, is a um, 2.36 million dot OLED panel, which means it's nice and steady. It's very crisp. They haven't increased the magnification. It's I think it's 0.62 times or around that sort of ballpark, which places it on the slightly smaller side of things compared to, say, Panasonic's latest, Olympus's latest, Sony's latest. It's a little bit small. It's still bigger than a lot of DSLRs, I, sh I should point out, the viewfinder image. And, of course, you can overlay lots of things. But it's a shame Fujifilm didn't take the opportunity to, to magnify that further. That's one of the big differences and one of the big benefits of going with the X-T2. The viewfinder resolution is the same, but the image is just magnified so much more. It's huge. You know, it's, it's very involving. But one major advantage that the X-T20 has over its predecessor and the X-T2, the screen, which still tilts upwards by uh, about 90 degrees and tilts down by about 45 degrees. That's not changed, but it's now touch sensitive. It is the first, I think, interchangeable lens X series camera from Fujifilm that has a touch screen. They, uh, of course, introduced it on the X70 Compact, and it's pretty much the same functionality here. So you can tap to reposition the AF area. You can tap to pull focus in movies. I'm going to show you a, a clip of that later on. You can swipe through images and playback and also uh, scrub through videos. That works really, really well. What you can't do is use the touch screen to navigate any of the settings. Now, there could be an argument for not doing it on the main menu system because you could say, oh, you know, the little, little words. They're too hard to tap. Although, you know, Canon's touch interface works really well with those menus and so does Panasonic. So, I think I don't think that's an issue. But let me show you this. This is the Q menu interface on the uh, XT20. So I'm getting a few reflections from my uh, window on the other side of the room there. But hopefully you can see that it's a grid. It's a grid of uh, four by four characters, four by four icons, four by four settings that you can actually customize this screen to show whichever ones you want, which is really nice. But these are big, chunky icons that are crying out to be tapped. I just want to tap these. I want to say, look, there's the image quality. There's the white balance. There's the film simulation. I want to tap them and change them, but I can't. Look, nothing. So I think that's a bit disappointing. I feel that the the touch screen has not been implemented as, as much as it could do. Like, I, I rather hope that Fujifilm, I mean, it's the important thing is the hardware is now present in this camera. And hopefully maybe in a future firmware update, they will enable greater touch functionality. But at the moment, I feel that they're, they're kind of, they're just dipping their toe in the water. They don't, they don't want to go too far yet. But whenever I see interfaces like that, I just want to tap them. How about you? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'd be surprised if that wasn't in the very first for a more upgrade. One of the other things I should say is that when you do tap the screen to reposition the AF area, now I, I shoot a lot with the screen flipped up at a, at a lower level. Um, and when I go to tap to reposition the AF point, I'll show, you, I'll show you what happens. We can't actually quite see it. What happens is if I've got the camera set up as it is by default to switch between the viewfinder and the screen using the sensor on the on the viewfinder, that sensor is very sensitive. And pretty much as soon as I put my finger, in fact, you, you almost can see it. Mm -hmm. As soon as I put my finger close enough to the screen to tap it, to reposition the effort, it goes off. And then I have to move it away and I go, you know, where's it gone? And then I go to position it again and the screen goes off again. Because it thinks that I'm going, it thinks that I've got my face up to the viewfinder. That viewfinder eye sensor is very, very sensitive, and it is a bit annoying if you're using the touch screen. So, I mean, the, the easy solution is you just press this button to the side of the viewfinder, and that then configures it to just say, no, I'm just using the screen, or no, I'm just using the viewfinder. But if you have it set to the sensor, then it is a bit annoying using the touch screen. I just want to mention that. Yeah, you know, one of the one of the hacks that some of the Sony users make use of is to put a little piece of tape that partially covers that sensor. Really? Because so on, on some of the Sony cameras, especially if you do that, you flip the screen up. If you hold it too close to your body, that alone will trigger the switch to the EVF. 
um, and uh, you can actually cover over par- that sensor part way to make it less sensitive. That sounds to me like some elaborate accessory somebody should uh, should make that uh, clips over it. I think so. I could sell those. There's a business plan for you. You could sell it with your uh, with your Leica uh, button. There you go. Oh, then, then it would be hundreds of dollars. Exactly. Yeah, and then we could retire. <laughs> Finally, Doug. One last job. Just one more. Okay. So right, that's the physical stuff covered. The major, the major, major is bigger than major. Is the next step up. The major upgrade of the XT20 is the fact that it now has the latest X-Trans 3 sensor. So this is still APS-C in size. It still uses uh, Fujifilm's, you know, rather unique color filter array. It's 24 megapixels. It's exactly the same sensor that you get in the X-Pro2, in the X-T2, and also the X-100F, I believe. I've not reviewed that one yet, but I think it's the same sensor. So naturally, it's now filtered down onto this more affordable body. And because it also has the, uh, the I think it's the X-Processor Pro, it has the same image processor as the X-T2 as well. So what this means is that it inherits a lot from the X-T2, and there was a certain number of opportunities for Fujifilm to kind of hobble the X-T20 or downgrade it in some way, but I'm pleased to say that they haven't. So it means that you get the same resolution, the same image quality. You have access to the same series of film simulations, which includes their Acros high contrast black and white simulation, which is probably my favorite black and white uh, process of, of any of the cameras around at the moment. It also means you get those grain simulations that we saw uh, introduced on those earlier higher end bodies. We also finally get to shoot um, RAW at the extended ISOs, like 100 ISOs. So that's really important for people who are doing long exposure photography because previously with X-Trans 2, if you wanted to use 100 ISO, because that's lower than the base sensitivity, then you had to shoot in JPEG only. Now, that's okay if, like me, you shoot in camera. But if you want to change the white balance later or you didn't quite get it right, then that's a pain in the butt. Uh, you really want to be able to shoot in RAW so you can change those things easily, even if you change them in camera, as I do, using the uh, the, the RAW processing in playback. So, great, it's it's got that. And, of course, it also means that the X-T20 inherits exactly the same embedded phase detect autofocus system as the X-T2. That means it uh, now covers a broader area. It covers 40% of the uh, of the sensor. Uh, it means its tracking is better. Now, the X-T2 had five uh, custom profiles for autofocus, which kind of handled different situations, you know, like unpredictable subjects that were, you know, moving all around the frame, ones that were approaching at predictable speed, ones that were doing that, but might suddenly have someone or something getting in the way that you'd need to ignore, that sort of thing. It kind of had like five profiles and it let you customize those and it let you also do a complete custom one of your own. Now the X-T20 inherits the five basic uh, kind of scenarios, but you can't customize them. And there there isn't that sixth custom option. But still, that's still pretty good to have those on a camera of this class. So, you know, that's a bit of a differentiation with the X-T2. You know, I say, yeah, fine. I'm pleased that they've put that in there. Um, One of the other things that they've done, which is a big improvement over the X-T10, is the actual burst depth. Now, the top speed with the mechanical shutter is still eight frames per second but previously it would only shoot the xt10 would only shoot at eight frames per second for about a second and a half so you'd get about 16 frames and that was it that was even in jpeg so what that would mean is that you needed to be pretty precise about when you wanted to start shooting if you were shooting some action because the buffer would just fill and it would really slow down at that point so the top speed with mechanical shutter is still eight frames per second but i uh, shot in my test 125 frames which I think is about 15 seconds worth. So that that's much more comfortable. And even if you're shooting in RAW, I managed to shoot 28 frames um, before it slowed down versus seven. So that's a big upgrade over the X-T10. That makes it much more usable. The blackout has been reduced on the viewfinder between the frames, but if you want live feedback, you are going to have to reduce it to, I think, about the five frames per second kind of medium speed mode. And I also found that when I was shooting with continuous autofocus at eight frames per second, it was a bit erratic. So I prefer to shoot at five anyway, have more consistent gaps between each frame and also the live feedback. But here's a bonus I wasn't expecting. If you switch it to the electronic shutter, you have access to the 14 frames per second of the X-T2. And it, and it works fine, even with continuous air. So um, it's really nice that, that you've got, you can't shoot quite as many frames in a burst, but it's still very, very usable. So these are these are some nice things that, that you would probably have expected them to not put in the SC20, but they have. 
But are, are you, if you go to electronic shutter at those higher burst rates, are you getting the live feedback are you, or do you have the lag that we've talked about in previous reviews? Well, what happens, something interesting happens because if what you really want to happen is for the camera to kind of release the playback and get straight into a live picture as quickly as possible when you're shooting a burst, because when you see a live picture, it allows you to move the camera to recompose, to follow the subject. That's that's the ideal. That's what we're used to with an optical viewfinder on the DSLR. So that that's the ideal. But something interesting happens with an electronic camera when you are doing the other approach, which is to just show you the last image captured in playback. Now, that is a problem if you're capturing at, say, five frames per second, because there's serious lag and the subject could have moved considerably by the time you get a chance to play back the next image and then try and compensate or overcompensate. It's very, very hard. But as frame rates increase, then this actually becomes less and less of an issue. And if you're shooting at, now this one doesn't do this, but if you're shooting at say 24 frames per second with an electronic shutter and it's playing back the image, well, that's fast enough to be real time anyway. You're only talking about, you know, a, a split second of difference, of, of tiny, tiny difference. So in fact, this whole kind of live, Thing becomes a uh, becomes moot at uh, higher uh, frame rates. So at 14 frames per second, it's not quite there, but it's not bad. It's it's actually quite easy. It's easier to follow stuff than it than you'd think, even though it doesn't have the you know the live feedback. It is just playing it back, but it's playing it back at 14 frames per second. So it's it's almost real time. So the the bottom line is yes, it is quite it's easier than you think to follow action with it at 14 frames per second. What about the video? Yeah, I'm just going to give one one little complaint before I move on to okay. that. Um, for some bizarre reason, Fujifilm. Now, I, I don't. Um, I'm not into exposure bracketing. I don't really do HDR or anything like that. But those who do would expect to have, like, ten years ago, a camera that could do more than three frames in a burst. Uh, but still, Fujifilm, and it's the same with this. It still only does three frame AB, which is bizarre. It'll be two EV apart, uh, but still just three frame it'll fire them all in a quick burst which is nice and it'll trigger them with a self timer which is also nice but three frames doesn't really cut the mustard and we complain about it every time and they address almost everything but for some reason this is one feature that continues to be you know abandoned. that is, that is it's sort of bizarre because everybody else has responded to that mm. um and it again it's you'd think it'd be an easy thing for them to do but they haven't done it yet yeah. Okay. So let's move on to movies. Now it has the same sensor and the same image processor as the X-T2. So you would, um, you know, you'd be forgiven for assuming that it has the same video capabilities. It doesn't, it doesn't. So first of all, it will record 4K video. And like the X-T2, it will only record 10 minutes worth, right? There are some heating issues, overheating issues that prevent it from going any further. Now, the X-T2 resolved this if you bought the optional battery grip, because then it would basically use the batteries in the battery grip first before it used the one in the body, allowing it to stay cooler. Obviously, it gave it a larger physical mass as well, and that allowed it to extend 4K recording times to half an hour clips at a time. But there is no battery grip for the X-T20, so it is limited to 10 minutes, which is a bit, well, you, you have to work it out. You know, maybe that's enough for you. Maybe it's not. Uh, but everyone else does half an hour per clip. Apart from things, you know, high end cameras like the GH5, which just keeps going until, you know, you run out of memory or power. Uh, so 10 minutes is not is not very long. More interestingly, or perhaps concerningly, because you think, well, that's OK. I'll just film in 1080. But like the X-T2, 1080p clips are limited to 15 minutes hmm. unless you have the battery grip, which isn't available for this body. So if you want to see them, well, what do I need to do to get on a half hour clip out of the X-T20? Well, you need to drop to 720p, which to me is a bit kind of, that That seems a little bit kind of backward on this body if you're into video and if you're into longer clips. Now, again, if you're, I mean, if you're filming events or interviews, then this, this could be an issue for you. Uh, if you're just doing, if you're doing more kind of film-based stuff and you're doing scenes, then maybe it's not an issue. You, 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 have to decide for yourself whether that's a problem or not interestingly though you will notice when you are filming video with the xt20 that there is no crop to the field of view horizontally whereas there is on some of the other fuji bodies so it is actually um cropping and rendering it in a different way to the xt2 at the time we recorded this podcast i had not done a full analysis on this yet but i had read some of the people's 
who I trust, and they reckon that the way the X-T2 sampled the data from the sensor to generate a 4K frame was superior to the way the X-T20 did it. I'm still looking into it, and I'm talking to the engineers in Japan as well. So um, if you come across this video or podcast after I've had a chance to update the review at cameralabs.com, then you'll see the full story. Um, But it does it differently, I'll tell you that. It may not do it as well. Speculation. And of course, the the one advantage of using the full width is that if your goal is to shoot wide angle, you get the full width of your wide angle lenses. Yeah, absolutely. There's no field reduction. So that is a benefit. But like I say, I think it downsamples in a less sophisticated way. That means you may not see as much detail as you would with the X-T2. So that could be an interesting difference. But but one of the bigger differences is, you know, the potentially long recording time that you get with the X-T2 when you fit the uh, the battery grip to it. Now, of course, what the X-T20 does have, which the X-T2 doesn't have, is a touchscreen and you can use it to pull focus. Here's a video that I filmed in uh, my local Bond Street uh, coffee cafe. And what I'm doing is using the touchscreen to try and pull focus between the jar of sugar in the foreground and the lights in the background. I'm being very careful to make sure that I'm touching within the face detect af area so i'm not being mean here and touching towards the edge of the screen where the um the autofocus isn't going to be as responsive but what you'll notice is that it it works pretty well in one direction generally going from far to near but not so well when it was going from near to far i don't think that would be consistent it it completely depends on the subject but what i will tell you is that it, it is very hesitant at times compared to a lot of other cameras You know, I mean, if you look at, say, Panasonic's cameras are um, contrast-based only, not phase detect, and they felt more confident. Sony's cameras work better than that. Canon's dual pixel CMOS AF works better than that. So I was a bit concerned. I did try it with a couple of different lenses on the X-T20, and it it was a bit, like I say, it was a bit hesitant at times. It lacked confidence at times. You can see it kind of, especially when it was going from the foreground to the background, it kind of, it went halfway, and then it went, is that enough? No, I'm going to go a bit further. Is that enough? I'm almost there. Now I'm going to go a bit further. And it didn't overshoot, but at the same time, it didn't just go straight there, as you would expect. So if you're hoping that that touchscreen combined with the phase detect AF system is going to let you pull focus very smoothly from one subject to another, it might not. You should do some more research on that. Try and seek out as many different videos as you can. I've just provided one. You might find ones that work better for your scenario, but I wanted to warn you about that. And one of the good things that you can do, like the X-T2, is apply the film simulations to video. So here's one I filmed with the Acros black and white film simulation, which, you know, I, I really, really like the style of this. Um, that's Brighton uh, Royal Pavilion, by the way. So you can do that. What you can't do, though, with this, here's another difference between it and the X-T2. There's no flat profiles. So if you're into grading afterwards, you're not going to really be able to do this on the X-T20. You could, you, could, you could set up your own profile that was as flat as possible, you know, turning everything down. But there's no super duper flat. There's no log profile on it. Yeah. So what do you think? Does, oh, and it doesn't have 1080p stops at 60p. It doesn't have 120p. So it doesn't have slow motion, things like that. So, you know, it's 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 it's. It's good. It's good, and it's definitely better than the XT10 was at video, but it's you know overshadowed by what's possible on things like Sony's A6300 and Panasonic's G80 and G85. Yeah, I you know what we said at the top of the show, which is that it's very definitely scaled down from the XT2 in terms of features, and video is just part of that. Um, I'm going to mention a couple that I picked up from your written review that you may or may not have mentioned already. Uh, one, of course, is this camera has less weatherproofing than the X-T2. Um, uh, it, the X-T2 doesn't have the touch uh, screen, but it has the autofocus joystick. Mm-hmm. So that's a different mechanism there. Uh, the X-T2 has the dual SD slots. It has USB 3. It has the full size, if you will, mic jack. Uh, the optional battery gip you mentioned. And it has a dedicated... ISO dial in place of the mode dial. So I think, uh, as we said, this camera is going to have the same image quality as the X-T2, but the X-T20 is going to be sort of cut back in every feature and convenience area slightly. Yeah, I mean, since we're talking about it, I mean, I do want to go back and talk about the Wi-Fi on this camera, but since we're talking about the X-T2 and the differences, 
In addition, you get the larger viewfinder magnification on the X-T2. It's got a faster 8,000th of a second mechanical shutter. The screen doesn't only angle out that way, it angles out sideways as well. So if you're holding it in the portrait orientation, which I do a lot, it angles out a bit, which is, which is really helpful. As Doug said, it has dual SD memory card slots, but by employing a new SD memory slot module, component in the camera has allowed them to go out and shop for a more modern one that will exploit the extra speed of uhs class 2 cars at least in slot one um what else does it have uh the, the grip three the, yeah the usb3 yeah. it has a bigger grip it's definitely more comfortable to hold and as you say you know the, the the real kind of killer upgrade for it is the battery grip that not only triples the battery life it extends the uh, video recording it, it extends the mechanical uh, burst speed to 11 frames per second you get a headphone jack you get um you get a lot extra but by the time you've added that to it, it i think it becomes like about a two thousand dollar camera so i mean it's more than twice the price so you'd you would expect it to to have a lot and this is this is the thing you know i mean they've they've sat down and very carefully thought what should we have and what what don't we have i mean we could say yeah let's put this in it put this in it but before you know what's happened you've created the same camera for the same price so i'm i'm quite I'm quite satisfied with what they've done. In fact, let's talk about the image quality as well, because it is the same as the the X-T2. You and I are both big fans of uh, Fujifilm's image processing. I personally think it is probably the best um, in terms of in-camera JPEGs. And again, I'm going to give an advert for my book because you'll see about half of the 100 images that are in there are taken with Fujifilm cameras, and they're, they're all out-of-camera JPEGs because... They do, they do it so well in those feature film cameras. They look really, really nice. So if you're after a camera that produces really nice image quality with the least amount of effort, which is what I am after, then the XT20 will give you, will give you that um, at a more affordable price. Doug, have you found the kind of out-of-camera quality from, from the Fuji films? How do you think it compares to, to their rivals? Oh, no, I think it's the best. Uh, in fact... Um I don't particularly like, I have Sony cameras. I don't particularly like the JPEGs. I find them to be rather rather cold in terms of color temperature. Um, I don't like the color look overall. But Fuji, either even just straight without any of the emulations, but if you use the classic Chrome or the Acros, they're gorgeous. Ab absolutely. I mean, mm. if, you want, if, you want, if you want the simplest high quality shooting, I think it's really hard to beat any of these Fujis. Yeah, now... I do want to go back and just mention one last thing about uh, about the X-T20 in particular because it also applies to all the Fujifilm cameras today. Their Wi-Fi solution. So this camera has, uh, the X-T20 has uh, Wi-Fi, it doesn't have NFC. And the implementation, the app that, that controls it, the Fujifilm app, works in pretty much the same way as those before it. So there's four main options. There's two ways to transfer images. You can either initiate the selection of images from the phone or from the camera. You can remote control the camera and that works pretty well. There's a lot of manual control and there is a GPS option to log locations. Now, when testing the X-T20, you see, I'd noticed something on some previous models that bothered me and I looked into it further here. Here is what bothered me. When you start the location logging on the Fujifilm app, this is at the time we we filmed this uh, this podcast. Hopefully, they will update this at some point in the future. But what happens is the app goes to your phone and says, uh, right, what's the position? Where are we now? And the phone says, we're here. Here we are. And the app provides that over Wi-Fi to the camera and the camera actually embeds it there and then so it's not a, it doesn't create a log that's then synchronized later it embeds it there and then and the app then says you know what i'm going to make this gps position available for the next 60 minutes so for the next 60 minutes the next hour any pitch you take is going to get tagged and you think cool yeah that that's that sounds good. That sounds like what I want. And then presumably it'll turn off the Wi-Fi and everything to save power. But what they don't tell you is that it, it doesn't change the position. So it still sends the exactly the same position to all of your pictures over the next hour, regardless of where you've gone. So what I was finding is that the position is correct for the first pitch you take. But then if you then walk up 100 meters somewhere else and take another picture, then the location's wrong because it's still using, it's still embedding the previous GPS position, which is daft as far as I'm I'd, concerned. I'd, I'd rather have no coordinates at all than have yeah. them be wrong. 
So as you'll see, if you look at my sample images of the X-T20 at camelabs.com and have a look at, there's about a series of about 10 of them that I took on the same day as I walked around uh, my hometown of Brighton, you will see that they all have, they're clearly different locations, but they all have exactly the same GPS position. Only one of them is correct. It's a bit like, you know, a clock that stopped. It still tells the time, right? You know, <laughs> twice a day. Well, you know, one of these images was right. The rest of them weren't. Now, at a certain point, the app, kind of recognizes that it's gone a bit too far from the original starting point and the icon changes and it goes red on on the camera screen and it says look i think you should um i think you should reacquire the position and the way you have to do that is actually turn it all off disconnect it and then reconnect it all and start again that is the solution yeah. and um and then it will be correct but only for that one picture so you have to do it manually one picture at a time and this also applies to the xt2 and all of the previous models so i'd actually got this wrong in my reviews before because i reckoned that i i'd assumed that when it said you know it's available for the next 60 minutes that it was going to be updating those coordinates and that for some reason my phone wasn't working properly and i tr was trying different phones i was trying to diagnose it and i spoke to fujifilm about it and said no actually that that's how it works it's um you know, perhaps, perhaps we should change that. And uh, I think they should change that. So beware, if you're using the GPS thing, then beware that it will only work on the location in which you activate it. And then you should really just deactivate it. Um, and then do it again, or just use a different solution, use a third party app and actually just record a log and sync it later. I think that's probably the best solution, don't you? Yeah, that's what I do. I use an app called uh, Galileo Offline Maps which both, both gives me maps of anywhere in the world, plus it does my logging for me. It does a very good job. It's what Galileo would have wanted. It, yeah, absolutely. Well, he, he wrote it. <laughs> he did. He yeah. was ahead of his time. Well, it's got his, it's got his name on it. Come on. Exactly. He's not going to muck about. Yeah. So we finished on the X-T20. So why would you buy this compared to, let's have a look. So we mentioned the A6300, the Sony. Uh, what does the Sony do? Uh, that the, this doesn't well it uh, shoots at 11 frames per second uh, it'll do eight frames per second with live view so it's faster the autofocus array extends to virtually the entire frame whereas on the fujifilm it's concentrated to a square which is pretty much the full height of the frame but obviously it's square so it's not the full width uh, you can record 4k video for up to 30 minutes you can do 1080 at 120p so it'll do slow motion you've got flat profiles the video capabilities are much better however uh, and the viewfinder magnification is bigger. However, it does not have a touch screen. And to me, the ergonomics are nowhere near as good. And the out of camera JPEG quality, it's definitely getting better on the Sony's, but I still prefer the Fujifilm. So, I mean, you've shot with the A6300, Doug. How, you know, which would, which would you get? Well, I happen to own a lot of Sony gear. I own no Fuji gear. If I were starting from the beginning, you know, to me, I just got to say, the Fuji cameras are the maybe my favorite general purpose cameras. Um, the issue for me is that when you want things that are more specialized, like even faster autofocus, things like that, then you tend to go somewhere else. Um, my Sony, my Sony A6300 is my my action camera right now. I'll use it for shooting things that move quickly. Mm. Um, and we should also say that if you do desperately want an A6300 with a touch screen, you can spend a bit more for, on the A6500, get a touch screen and also get built in stabilization and Bluetooth, which does a really nice uh, GPS solution with your phone. Yeah. So, like I say, if I, if, I were, if I were starting from scratch and I really only needed general purpose gear, I'd probably be shooting with Fuji instead of Sony. So let's look at Panasonic. So they have the G80 or the G85 because they have different names depending on your region. Now, this is a micro four thirds camera. So the sensor is a bit smaller. It's also a uh, low resolution. But in my tests, the quality is very, very similar in terms of resolution and noise levels. The APS-C models, all of them become cleaner above about 6400 ISO. But below that, they're very, very close. And you can look at my quality pages if you want to see, you know, they're, they're super close. What the G80, G85 has over the Fujifilm is again that bigger um, viewfinder magnification. Its screen is not only touch sensitive, but it's fully articulated, side hinged, so you've got a lot of flexibility there. It has 4K video for half an hour, um, and of course, being a Panasonic camera, it has all of those innovative 4K photo modes that effectively let you shoot um, 8 megapixels at 30 frames per second and refocus after the event and stack images and blah, blah, blah. It does a lot. Look at our reviews of those if you want to find out more. It also has built-in image stabilization that's working really well on those Panasonic bodies now. You know, it doesn't shoot quite as fast, um, but 
well, that's if you're shooting full resolution. You can, of course, shoot at 30 frames per second if you want to go in the 4K photo mode. So, you know, there's a lot to weigh up here. I think in terms of general purpose cameras, the uh, that Lumix G80, G85 is really hard to beat. It's it's a really, really nice camera. That's the, that's the camera that I would go for if video were, were important to me. Mm. Uh, it happens in my photography. It's not. I rarely shoot video. But if, if video was an important thing, that would pull me to that away from the Fuji. Yeah, because you're getting 4K video for half-hour clips and you're getting a, a variety of flattish profiles and you've got that built-in stabilization, which means you can handhold video with prime lenses and get a really, really nice result. So that's that's a that's a really nice solution. It does not have phase detect autofocus, but its contrast-based system is supremely fast and works in very, very low light as well, which is something that a lot of people don't talk about. And then from Olympus, the EM5 Mark II is is quite old now you know it doesn't record 4k video in fact its video is is way behind these these models but its ergonomics and styling is really nice it has it, it has the debut of their uh, high-res capture mode you know which shifted the sensor to to capture generate a high resolution image as long as nothing moved during that capture period very good stabilization um you know, it's it's a nice it's a nice camera. I still every time I use the M5 Mark II, I'm, I smile. You know, and there's a lot to be said for that. But I think really the main two to compare this to are the A6300 and the Lumix G80 G85. Hopefully, Olympus will come out with an EM10 Mark III later on in 2017. Um, and also consider, as we've as we mentioned at the start, the XT1, the earlier flagship, which is now discounted quite heavily. Look for a really good deal on that, and you get a nice weatherproof body with a bigger grip, bigger viewfinder magnification. Um, you know, these are there's a, so many good cameras, so many good cameras, so many cameras, so little time. And yet we have so much time to discuss them. Though <laughs> we still have we made it to an hour yet? We've made it to an hour. So this is this is the point where we say thank you to everyone for uh, sticking around this long. You know, we got a lot of very nice comments on YouTube from people who say I stuck around to the end, and I salute you, each and every one of you, for sticking around to the end. Um, no one else does this, I don't think. Talks uh, and at length for this amount of time. Some people said, look love the videos. Why don't you make them shorter? <laughs> you know, love the reviews. Be even better if they're only 200 words long. And sure, you know, sometimes you do want some very quick overviews. And on the reviews at Camelabs.com, I do start with the verdict. Now I start with a summary. So I've got a 100 word summary, you know, which tells you everything you want in just a couple of seconds. And then it starts with a verdict and then it goes bigger and bigger and bigger if you want more and more detail. But I think there's so many people doing short reviews and so few people doing long ones you know i i enjoy going into this amount of detail and hopefully doug does as well he's not going wow this guy does not go on why did i get involved in this you know i'm too polite to tell him to clear off or shut up but you know this is what we do we we do detailed in-depth reviews and uh, we know some of you or that there are there is an audience for it so we appreciate you sticking it out to the end i mean doug you wouldn't want to do them any shorter would you he's nodding <laughs> oh no i'm awake i'm awake no, I think, uh, uh, again, we get what we really appreciate is getting your feedback because the feedback uh, means a lot to us in terms of what direction we take it. If it weren't for your feedback, Gordon wouldn't have been through two or three different microphones. He wouldn't have changed his shirt. Um, but anyway, I think it's been great. Gordon, another great review. Uh, I want to thank all of you for watching, listening, and reading. And by reading, I mean if there's anything that you want to know more about this camera or anything else who we review here, go over to CameraLabs.com and look at Gordon's in-depth written reviews, the longest reviews on the internet. That should be the strap line. The longest reviews on the internet. Do you know, I did have a thing where it was T TLDR was the working name for it. Uh, but surprisingly <laughs> some people didn't understand uh, what that meant more than i yeah. thought so i thought all right it's already no one understands it already i'm not going to make it even harder to understand yeah. i should say um you know thanks thanks for supporting us you you know all the ways to support camera labs uh, if you want to uh, shoot with doug go to dougk.com and check out his uh, upcoming workshops see if there's one in your neck of the woods because he's a great guy to meet great guy to shoot with so um lots of ways that you can uh, meet up with us if uh, if you'd like to get even more You've been yeah. with us for an hour. You want more, more Gordon, more Doug. That's where yeah. to get it. If, 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 there's, if you're interested in the X-T20 or anything else we review, do go over to cameralabs.com. Click there on the purchase links because there's a few pennies that come into the, the coffers and help us keep this thing going. You can always buy us cups of coffee. Those always are important, especially to me because when we record these, it's usually very early here in California, although it's late in the afternoon in Brighton, England. 
Um, also, make sure to check out Gordon's book, In Camera. You can find it on Amazon uh, all over the world probably by now. Yes. And um, uh, I guess that's it. Gordon, thank you very much for another great review. The X-T20 Fuji has, I think, another winner here. Yeah, I really like it. I think they've got a really good balance of features in the body size and at the price point. So I think it's going to be it's going to be a big hit. Very good. Gordon, thanks again. And thank you all for watching. Thank you once again for watching and listening. We'll see you next time on the Camera Labs Photography Podcast. Bye bye.